What's the story, Morning Glory? What is the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Married at First Sight, Season 18, Episode 3, Did Y'all Meet My Husband? Let's talk about David and Michelle. So it's their wedding day. Um, when David saw her, you could tell he was really, really happy because he got exactly what he wanted. And by the way, this is also David's 36th birthday. So this was probably the best birthday present for him ever, a beautiful blonde hair, blue-eyed blue wife, because he keeps harping on that. He keeps repeating that to us, how he really wanted to be matched with a blonde-haired woman with blue eyes. That was his biggest thing. I'm pretty sure if they had him write out, if Married at First Sight had them write out, um, what are your top priorities in a partner? I think number one, David put blonde hair and blue eyes above everything else. So when he saw her, of course, he was really pleased. Now her father, because her father walked her down the aisle, her father does not look like the kind of father that is willing to give his daughter away to a basement boy, to a boy that lives in his parents' basement. So I'm very interested to find out what her father's reaction is going to be um, to David living in his parents' basement. So he kept his eyes on her throughout the whole ceremony. So when they're up there at the altar and the officiant is talking, um, he his eyes are absolutely glued on her. She's looking at the officiant. She's looking around. She's looking at the officiant. She's looking at David. His eyes are glued on her. Okay, that's one thing that I did notice. So in the speech that the officiant gives of um, what his family wants her to know about David, one of the things that they mentioned was that he's a mama's boy, which I felt like that could have been kept out. I don't know like what planet David and his family are from for them to not understand that to a potential mate, a potential wife, um, to say that your husband or your soon to be husband is a mama's boy. It's not a flex. It's not a positive thing. It's not something that women gravitates towards. I don't think women when, when they're looking for a partner are looking for people who describe themselves as mama's boy. When they are looking at dating profiles, they're not scouring the descriptions, you know, trying to find, oh is he a mama's boy is he a mama's boy no one is looking for that so for the by the fact that they put that in their description about him to her i thought that that was uh sorry and not good not good at all so they get married um when they have their little one-on-one -on -one, uh once again you can tell david is very happy with her um she's blonde once again, blonde hair, blue eyes. She's also very independent. And they talk about him smoking. He says that he's a social smoker and she doesn't like that. So he's like, you know what? I'll quit. Whatever you want, baby, I'll do it for you. So he says he's going to try to quit smoking. And then he tells her like really fast and like, you know, um, the words were just spilling out of his mouth really fast. He tells her that he still lives at home with his parents, that he has two careers and that he's doing this by choice. He doesn't live there because he has to. He lives there because he wants to. And it, it all came out really fast, but she caught every single word of it. So she was like, oh, my gosh. She literally said, oh, my gosh, that's crazy. Um you know, like that's a very normal reaction that a woman would have to somebody that she just married who tells her that he still lives with his parents at the age of 36. So um, he, um, she looked clearly worried that, you know, he was still living at home. And then Michelle says, uh, but it's not forever, right? And he was like, oh, no, 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 of course not. Then he talks about this condo that he was renovating or whatever. I couldn't understand. I didn't understand. I couldn't follow what he was saying. And if it doesn't make sense in the words of Judge Judy, it, it's not true. So this explanation, this convoluted explanation about he has his own home, but he's re renovating it or rebuilding it or doing something with this condo. And that's why he's staying at home. Yeah, we're not buying that, David. We're not buying that at all. And what are these two careers that he has? Um, I'm pretty sure he mentioned it or the show um, let us know what his career is. But what is it exactly? Um, his two careers that he keeps on mentioning over and over again. So now we're at the reception. So while they're dancing, um, he asked her, what was her first impression of him? And she said, oh, you look like the genie, you know, I guess from the movie Aladdin, uh, you look like a genie or the genie or whatever, which he truly does. And then um, 
he asked her like, you know, how do you feel? How are you doing or whatever? And she says, I'm overwhelmed. Now I've watched this show enough to know that when someone says they're overwhelmed in the very beginning, like, you know, on their wedding day, and they can only describe how they're feeling as being overwhelmed, um, most likely they're not happy with who they were matched with but they're too scared to say that, or it's not the right time to say that. So they'll just say, oh, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. In other words, she's not happy with who she was matched with. So, and she says that she's really focused on the fact that he is still living with his parents. So when David is talking to her friends, um, they tell him that physically he checks all the boxes, that physically he is exactly what she likes, what she's into, what she's attracted to. When she's talking to his parents, she asks about the living arrangements. She says something like, so, you know, he tells me that y'all are roommates. And the mom is like, yeah, but, you know, he's ready to move out. Miss Ma'am, he's 36 years old. He better be ready to move out. He should have been ready to move out like 10 years ago. She's like, yeah, but he's ready to move out. You know, he's only with us or he's only living with us because we need him to do things. 24 hours around the clock? Like, why can't he come over, do what he needs to do to help y'all out and then go back home? Why does he have to live in the basement to help y'all out? Then they talk about David smoking and his father tells Michelle that he doesn't like the fact that his son smokes. His mother is a cancer survivor. So they're both trying to get him to quit. And they tell her, you know, to really push it, uh, to really push him to quit smoking. Okay, moving on. So Michelle is talking to her friends, right? And her friends want to know how she's doing. And um, she is wavering. Okay, she's wavering. She's like on the edge. She says that he seems very excited, but I'm hesitant. Then it, it looked like she really, really wanted to say something else, but then she stopped herself. And then um, she got... You could tell like she was trying to keep it together. She was getting emotional, just trying to keep it together, but the tears wouldn't stop. So the tears come out and she takes the napkin and she's like wiping her eyes and she tells her friends, you know, I don't want his family to see me like this. So they take her to the bathroom and their mics are still on. So we hear them talk about how she's very concerned about the fact that he's living with his parents. And the friends ask her, how do you know that? And she says, that's what he told me. And then they asked her why, and why is he still living with his parents? And she says, that's what I'm not clear on. So even she didn't understand his convoluted explanation about this condo that's under construction somewhere. So she says, you know, I can't help but be really focused on the fact that he is living at home with his parents. Now, David, on the other hand, he's really focused on the fact that she's attractive. That's all he talks about. Like he barely mentions anything about her personality or anything else. He keeps talking about how she's beautiful and she's got blonde hair and, you know, dark blue eyes. And he's really happy about that. So now it's time to get to the honeymoon, honeymoon suite. So they get to their honeymoon suite and they're sitting on the couch and he's really relaxed. You know, he's laid back on the couch. He put his arm like on the back of the couch as if he was non-verbally inviting her to snuggle in closer to him or to lay on him. And she was like very stoic. Um, her back was very straight. Um, she looked tense and no, she wasn't going to scoot over and get closer to him. And so once again, she brings up the fact that he's living at home with his parents. And um, he keeps talking about how, you know, I don't have to, I choose to. And he thinks that by him saying he chooses to live at home with his parents makes it better, but it doesn't. It doesn't make it better. Why wouldn't you want to choose to live on your own as an independent adult man? Why are you choosing to live with your mom and dad. It's almost like, you know, are there some attachment issues here? Are you having a hard time breaking? And you're 36 years old. You're four years away from 40. And you're choosing to live at home with your parents when the majority of us, as much as we love our parents, and if our parents don't need us, you know, to take care of them or anything like that, a lot of us like to have our own space, you know, away from mom and dad. And parents get that. Like, I will totally understand when my kids want to move out and do their own thing and have their own residence and, you know, live away from home. I get it. So 
the fact that you are choosing to live at home and neither one of your parents appear to be, you know, um, like they can't take care of themselves. They both look really healthy. They look really strong, really active. So if it's not you caring for your parents, none of us gets it, David. So all I can say is Michelle run, run for the hills, girl, run for the hills. Um, I don't even know if she's even attracted to him. I think the fact that he lives at home is killing the attraction. But for that, she may have been attracted to him, but she can't shake that off that he's still at home. So yeah, I, I don't really see this uh, progressing in a positive way, this particular relationship. Let's talk about Imam and Ikechi. So they're having dinner at the reception and he tells her that he wrote a book, which was just a bunch of letters to his wife. Now, I don't know if Imam and Ikechi are like, you know, fan favorites. And so what I'm about to say is probably going to be an extremely unpopular opinion about Imam and Ikechi. But Ikechi to me is extremely performative. Um, he's doing everything to me. It's like it's for show. His obsession of you know, like his obsession of wanting to be on the show and wanting to find a wife and him writing letters to this imaginary woman that he has yet to meet and writing songs for this imaginary woman that he has yet to meet. All of that to me, it's, how do I say this? Well, let me, let me, let's get to the song. I think I can express myself better when we get to the song. So, um, so he talks about how he wrote this book, which is a whole bunch of letters, which to me, that would not impress me. I would be concerned. <laughs> I would be concerned if my husband says, you know, I wrote a book and I'm just a bunch of letters to my future wife. And I would be like, why? Why? Why, why, why would you do that? I, I don't understand. Maybe I, I'm not sensitive enough. Maybe I'm not romantic enough, but that's got nothing to do with me. You know, the letters that you wrote to this future wife was this image of this woman that you created in your mind. It's not me. So those, it wouldn't have, but anyways, like I said, let me just hold off on that. So after dinner, Ikechi arranged for, I guess, a friend of his or whoever to sing her a song. So everybody gathers around and I guess it was like a small stage. So the singer gets up there, takes the mic and they, the singer starts to sing. It's a beautiful song. The guy had a great voice. Um, but if I was, if I was a mem, it would not touch me because the song is not written for me or about me. It's just a song that he wrote about whatever. It was just a, a love song that he wrote. It wouldn't have any meaning to me. You know, like if, I, don't, I can't even think of a singer off the top of my head. I don't know. Uh, if Chris Brown wrote a song, I'm not going to get all teary eyed and start having like an emotional moment because Chris Brown wrote this beautiful love song because he's not singing it to me. It's not about me. It's just a song that he wrote. And that's how I felt about this. But I think Ikechi wanted her to have some type of a reaction to this song, like the way he wanted her to have a reaction to the poem that he wrote. He wanted her to like start crying and, and get all emotional. And but it wasn't about her. Now, if they had been married for 10 years and then he wrote this song and it was, the song was inspired by his personal feelings towards Imam and about Imam and who she is, then I can understand if there wasn't a dry eye in sight, but he just wrote a song and now we're going to sit back and listen to it. I don't know if he's trying to promote his singing career, his songwriting career. I don't know what was going on with that. So, and I hope that it had the effect that he was looking for. So Okay, it catch so then he got up there and he kind of like I don't he didn't sing along with the singer but he he got up there and he said some things which to me was also performative. And I'm going to wear that word out when I talk about Ikechi, but that's how I feel about him. Like he does things for a reaction to me. And I know that's probably an extremely unpopular opinion about these people. And, um, but that's just how I feel. I, I can't come to y'all any other way other than to give y'all the real. So Imam is talking to her and it's time for her to be grilled by his groomsmen. So she sits down and they ask her, um, how are you feeling? Or how are you doing? And she goes, I'm good. I'm married now. So to her, she wears this whole wife thing, this whole I'm married thing as a, she wears it proudly as a label, you know, um, it's like it's not, now it's her identity. Now it's her identity to be a wife and to be married. Like she's no longer Imam, the nurse practitioner. Now she is Mrs. Ikechi. She is Ikechi's wife. That's like her new identity now. So um, 
I feel like both Imam and Ikechi, I don't know if they're going to make it or not, but they are very much, they have a, what they have in common is they're very much in love with the idea of love. Imam has probably been dreaming about being somebody's wife for forever. Ikechi, you know, he's like the married at first sight groupie. He's been uh, running around all over the country, chasing the show down, trying to get on the show. And so these people are both in love with the idea of love. And I don't know if they can actually see each other for the people that they actually are. They're just like so much into, oh, Imam is the wife that I've always imagined. And Ikechi is the man that made me a wife. And that's like all they see in each other, it seems like. But you know what? It's just the first day. So hopefully it'll get better and they can prove me wrong. So, oh, let me see. The groomsmen tell her that Ikechi has been writing to his future wife for, for a minute, for a while. He's been writing to his future wife. This guy is, I don't know if he's obsessed with getting married. I don't know if he's obsessed with the idea of being in love. I don't know what it is, but I think it's strange. I think it's really strange that, you know, for many, for however long, his groomsmen said for a minute, I'm pretty sure they were ashamed to say for exactly how long he's been writing letters to this imaginary woman. So Ikechi's talking to her cousin at the end of the night. No, sorry. Ikechi's talk. Yeah. Ikechi's talking to um, Imam's cousin at the end of the night. Well, he's being grilled by the cousin and the cousin asked him, how long was your longest relationship? And he says, 12 years. Then the cousin asked him, since that relationship, how long was your longest relationship? He said six to seven months, which is problematic. Okay. Which is a little bit problematic. Um, so the cousin was like, you know, okay, why were they, why, why were they so short? Why did they last um, for a very short time. And he says something like, well, I, I would, you know, I knew right away when it wasn't going to work out. So why prolong it? So when the cousin is grilling him, something about Ikechi to me was off again. It was almost as if Ikechi knows that he can fool a lot of people with his words. And the cousin even said, you're really good with your words. Ikechi knows he can fool a lot of people, i.e. women, with his words. He's very poetic with his words, very elegant with his words. He's very intellectual. So he knows he can fool a lot of women that way, but he knew he couldn't fool this cousin because automatically when he sat there in front of the cousin, I saw this wall go up and he was no longer the charismatic, wordy, catchy. You can tell his answers were very limited. He didn't want to give too much information. He didn't want to reveal too much of himself. He was very guarded when he was talking to the cousin and the cousin peeped all of that because in the cousin's confessional he was like you know basically i'm just gonna sum it up i got my good eye on him okay i got my real good eye on mr ikechi because he might be fooling my cousin but he's not gonna be fooling me so the cousin already figured him out the cousin already saw what the hell was going on there with ikechi so the cousin was wondering you know why did he leave houston because he, the cousin told us that he still has a house in Houston, but Ikechi told him, because the cousin asked Ikechi, do you plan on staying in Chicago? And Ikechi was like, yeah, I just renewed my contract. But then in the confessional, the cousin says, he still has a house in Houston, so I don't know how serious he is about staying in Chicago. Well, because he ain't staying in Chicago. <laughs> I don't think he's staying in Chicago. He's just trying to get on this show. He got on the show and wherever the chips may fall at the end of it all, he's probably going to go back to his house in Houston. Moving on to Juan and Carla. So I want to know how many other dating type shows or, or relationship type show type shows Carla has auditioned for. Something about Carla to me is not authentic and it's not genuine. Her whole entire hippie at a persona, um, you know, I just go wherever the wind takes me. I don't have a plan. I don't, I don't have a schedule. I don't believe in routines. It's just whatever I feel like. It, girl, are you really this free flowing spirit or is this just a guise to cover up the fact that you're unmotivated, unfocused, maybe lazy, you have no direction in your life and you just want to be taken care of by someone? Is that what's really going on? Because well, I, something about her is just not genuine you know she says that she wants to start like a yoga studio or something and she does the whole sound bowl thing all of these careers that or these things that she does that really doesn't equate to like a real job or a real career and her whole thing uh, her whole thing of you know oh yeah i'm just a free-flowing ball of energy i just whatever i feel like doing whatever happens it's all good you know i don't believe in routines and i don't believe in uh, i'm just what 
You can be a hippie. You can have that free spirit. But a lot of free spirits need a nine to five to survive, to make it. You know, your nine to five is probably going to feed into all the free spiritual things that you really want to do. But how do you pay the bills being a, a free flowing spirit or whatever you are? So, um, so during dinner, he tells her that he had developed an app. And um, which I thought was a little bit impressive. I didn't understand how the app worked because he said that he would, you know, whenever he would have to travel, he would arrive at the airport really early and he would see other people at the airport really early and he didn't understand why they weren't socializing. And so he developed an app to assist with that. I didn't understand it, but the fact that he developed an app, that was impressive. So um, she tells him that she doesn't care about money. Juan says, oh, thank you for saying that. But then we see a clip of an episode coming on later on in the season where it seems like Carla just wants to be taken care of, doesn't want to work. And he tells her, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> that's not going to be happening. But he just told her, well, thank you for saying that when she said, oh, I don't care about money. So in a way, Carla is kind of like letting him know what she's all about. And she's not about working. She's not about like working like the way the rest of us are working we work because we got to go to work the majority of the people here go to work because they have to you know you are tied to a job whether it's the job of your dreams whether it's a job that you hate whatever it is a lot of us have to go to work some we have to go do something to make money and it seems like carla's not about that <laughs> She's not about that. And the fact that she says, you know, she doesn't believe in schedules and regimens and routines and she doesn't love money. She doesn't care about money. Her whole thing is love and making a connection. Yeah, she's going to be connecting to his bank account real soon. So Carla talks to his brothers and I felt like the brothers were worried. I felt like the brothers probably felt like, you know, this might not be a good match for Juan. That's the feeling that I got when I was watching um, the, bro the brothers talk to her. Um, when she was talking to the brothers, I still felt like Carla was in character. I feel like she was just playing this character, um, this hippie character. And she's really determined to make Juan, you know, fall in love with this, this, this hippie persona that she that she's in, that she has invented. They get to the honeymoon suite. Now, this is the part that um, I felt like. Anyways, they get to the honeymoon suite, and before they go to bed, he plays the guitar for her. So he plays a little song for her, really cute, really romantic. And then after he was done with the song, she had on like a like a silk bralette and short set, and. Um, he looked at her and he asked her, so is this your usual attire when you go to bed? And she's like, no, I usually sleep naked. And he was like, well, I do too. And then she goes, well, you can sleep naked if you want to. And when they, when she said that, their eyes locked into one another and neither one of them looked away. And I was like, yeah, it's about to get on and popping tonight good for them because they are a cute couple they look good together and i felt like there was definite chemistry between them but um so yeah let them have fun whatever they want to do is fine camille and thomas so uh let's get to the nitty-gritty of camille and thomas so i just want to talk about so he during dinner he tells her that he was in a nine-year relationship four years ago and um she wanted he says that the girlfriend wanted to get married, but he really wasn't sure if he wanted to marry her. And this was concerning for Camille because she wonders if he has commitment issues. You know, how can you be with someone for so long and not get married to them? So I thought, well, maybe he just wasn't in the headspace to be married at that time. You know, who knows? I'm not going to really hold that against him, but he was in a long-term relationship that did lead to marriage. So when he's talking to her friends and her sister, um, he tells them that he had cheated on that woman that he was in a nine year relationship with. That's when things kind of got interesting. So he had cheated and he felt really bad about it or whatever. He went, he got counseling to figure out, you know, the root of the problem, what made him do that. So he, they were all really impressed with the fact that he went to counseling. Later on in the night, Camille is having a conversation with her bridesmaids and they tell her that, yeah, they do like, or no, she tells them, I really like him. 
And they like him too, but then they did mention that he had told them, you know, he cheated on his girlfriend. And then Camille was like, well, was it towards the end of their relationship? Because I can kind of understand if it was towards the end, because, you know, he did talk about how he was stuck in their relationship. He couldn't find a way out, which to me is a kind of a cop out. Um, and anybody can leave a relationship unless it's like a, an abusive relationship. Anybody can really leave, or I'm not going to say it's easy. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy to leave someone that you've been with for nine years. It's not easy, but you can definitely, you know, be upfront and honest. And, and I don't know. I just don't buy this whole thing about how he was stuck in this relationship. And that's why he ended up cheating because he couldn't get out of this relationship. I, I, I didn't buy that. I, I really didn't. Um, he, he could break up with people. And if it's like a situation where y'all are sharing rent and you just can't, you don't want to leave her with the rent or whatever, then make it clear to her, Hey, I can't, we can't be in a romantic relationship anymore. I don't want us to be together as a couple, but if we can live together until the lease is over, let's do that. Although I don't know, there's so many options. I just don't buy, I don't think there's a reason to cheat. Okay. I don't think there's ever a reason to cheat. If you don't want to be with somebody, just tell your significant other, look, I need to move on to other things. It's not easy. And I'm not saying that it's easy and it's not pretty. And a lot of times it's not peaceful, but it's better than cheating. I don't know, but I don't want to be too judgy. So um, the fact that he uh, went to therapy, I guess that was like a bonus point for Camille. They go to the honeymoon suite and she was really into him. He carried her over the threshold when they got to the honeymoon suite. Um, she wanted to cuddle with him. So she seems like, you know, like she's really into him, which is good. You know, let the bygones be bygones. I am. I hope that she has a conversation with him at some point about his cheating. Like, why did he cheat? What type of cheating was it? Was he having a long-term fling with this other woman? Was it a one-night stand? Who was it? How did it start? How did it end? I would have a lot of questions about that because I feel like, you know, when the going gets tough, he might cheat again. You know what I mean? But who knows? Madison and Alan. So y'all, they started off as my favorite couple. And I hate the fact that Married at First Sight showed us the future clips. And so they showed us the future drama. And yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed now because of some of the clips that I saw. So the rumor is that there is an infidelity that's going to be committed this season on this show. And at first I thought it could have been possibly um, <laughs> David and Carla because they're the ones that, you know, are like not that responsible and free spirits and who knows what they do for a living. <laughs> and that maybe that, um, that irresponsibility might attract them to each other. The fact that, you know, they, they don't really care about acting like adults. So I thought maybe that would attract them to each other. So I thought it was them. But then when I saw these future clips, um, I see, Definitely issues happened between Imam and Ikechi, and then I saw Alan crying in Imam's arms, which then I was like, why is Imam comforting Alan? So does this mean that Madison has something going on with Ikechi? Because I can't, I don't see that happening at all. So I don't know what happened. I hope my girl uh, Madison is not cheating on my boy Alan, because they kind of started off as like my favorite couple. Um, I really don't have much to say. Madison talks about how Alan really is not her type. She says that he's more polished, metro, and more athletic than what she's used to. Is that what she said? Or is he the opposite of that? I thought that's what she said. She's she's not that he's not her type because he's more polished and more metro and more athletic than what she's used to. I don't know. And then um her friends tell her that, you know, he was in a toxic relationship and there's a lot of family trauma because he talks about this 14 year uh, custody battle that his parents went through over him. And so that might have left him like emotionally damaged or whatever. Has he healed from that? Is that going to spill into his relationship with Madison? So on and so forth. Um, the only thing about Madison that kind of bothered me was when she was talking to his groomsmen and she had mentioned something about, you know, when people look at me, you know, they see a beautiful woman. And I was just kind of like, oh, girl, <laughs> what? Um, yeah, you're very attractive and whatnot. But I think I'm still a little bit, it's a little bit off-putting for me when someone is like talking about themselves in that way. Oh, yeah, people look at me and they're like, oh, what a beautiful woman. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, y'all. But there is definitely electricity between Madison and Alan. 
somebody to go check on Madison and see if she's pregnant yet because they look like they can keep their hands off each other. And that is my little review, y'all. I don't think I have anything else to say. I pray to God Al uh, Madison did not cheat on Alan with somebody on this cast because I don't think anybody else on this cast other than maybe Juan would be worth any it would be worth cheating with thank you so much for joining me <laughs> I really do appreciate it on your way out please don't forget to rate the video if you like this content subscribe to my channel I'll definitely talk to you later bye